thank you to Melbourne City Mission and the Family Reconciliation Mediation Program for sponsoring this webinar today. Good morning, uh, everybody. It is 10 o'clock. My name is Gregory Nicolau. I'm the founder and I now say former CEO of Australian Childhood Trauma Group. I've stepped down. I stepped down in February or January, end of January, beginning of February of this year. And the wonderful Monique um, Blom has stepped into the role of CEO. Um, if you ever wanted a baptism by fire, um, um, get a CEO right at the beginning of a pandemic in a country, and you'll certainly know, <coughs> excuse me, we've, we've gone from um, 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 developing other offices or, uh, in different places in Australia to making sure we can just keep going with our staff. As all of you will know that this pandemic has created all sorts of stressors for um, businesses and also for the clients that we um, work with. Now, just to make sure that you're on the right, um, or just before we do that, I must acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I am standing on and that we're all standing on because we've got people throughout um, Victoria who've come in and possibly further afield. I want to pay my respects to elders past, present, and those who may be elders into the future. And I'd particularly like to say um, thank you um, to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, to First Nations people uh, for allowing me to be uh, in your country. I've been here for 40 years. I uh, spent the first 20 years in Aotearoa, land of the long white cloud. And in 1980, I came across to this beautiful land. Um, so thank you. I'd also like to welcome everyone else uh, who's in the, uh, the webinar and particularly to thank Melbourne City Mission for putting the seminar on. I don't know if you recall, some of you might have been to our first uh, webinar that we ran for Melbourne City Mission a few weeks ago, and you'll know that we had a little disaster. I've forgotten, Freddie, what it's called. It was a, we had a, um, a something outage. What was network it? storm. A network storm. Thanks, Freddie. We had a network storm where basically the whole system, the whole internet went down. I am praying to all the gods in the world and all faiths in the world that we won't have a network storm today although we do have a bit of a backup and I hope that uh, you know, Telstra doesn't go down either. Um, just to check in that you are actually um, at the right workshop that's thriving in the workplace through supervision, reflective practice and self-care during challenging times. If in fact uh, you're expecting Mechanics 101, that this might be the time to quickly jump out of the webinar and go to the right one. And I really want to put a focus on how do we keep our work going, the focus of our work uh, when we are ourselves being challenged by the circumstances we find ourselves uh, surrounded by. A little bit of um, um, housekeeping, and just because I'm going to check the um, um, check that I can unshare and share, I'm just going to see, get a big picture of me instead. Um, I just wanted to let you know that um, housekeeping is pretty much, we're going to go, we've got an hour and a half together until 11.30. My plan is to talk for about an hour. It might go a little bit less, it might go a little bit more. I often find when we open up for questions, there's stunned silence and very few questions. So I'm gonna, and it's a lot easier if I had you in the room, I can sort of point at you. I have a few names now here on the right-hand side where I might be able to go, uh, let's see. Marita, what's happening in Marita down there at St Kilda? What questions do you have? And I might point at you and you'll come out with a question. As I said, there are two ways to ask questions. One is you can turn your microphone off and ask them. It's nice to hear other voices and not just my own. Uh, but you can also, um, if need be, uh, there's a Q&A. You'll notice there's a Q&A button. You can press that and put a question up there and I'll either see it or Freddie will see it and she'll read it out to me. If you just want to make a comment, rather than use the Q&A function, use the chat function. So you should see another icon there that says chat. Chat's for sort of talking, q and for asking questions. Hope that makes sense. We've got a few polls. I think there's four or five polls we have through to try and give some, um, we can interact a little bit more and just see what people are thinking. Those polls uh, will come up uh, throughout the uh, webinar series. And of course, I can't tell you where the bathrooms are because I don't know where the bathrooms are in your houses and offices, but I'm sure you'll, you'll know where they are and do what you need to do. Right, I've worked out that I can share and I can go back to that one and share and everything should be ready to go again. How about that? Um, we've got a, a poll straight away, Freddie, thanks. I just want to do a check-in to see how people are doing at the moment. Uh, Freddie's going to put up a little poll here and I think there are um, two or three questions that you can, uh, actually there's five questions. Um, I'd like you all just to go through those questions and um, tell us where you are at the moment and then we'll show the poll to everybody just to see how we're doing today, um, Wednesday. 
I need to change my glasses. I start off with these ones, but I can't see as clearly as when I put these ones on. But I tend not to start off with these ones because then someone says, what's that guy standing there with those funny wanky glasses? Actually, can you say the word wanky and wanky? And can you do it? Can you say that, Freddie? Do you think you can get away with that word in Australia? Not sure. Anyway. I feel like in Australia you can get away with most words. Most words. <laughs> we should have a poll on that. What's acceptable or not acceptable? Okay, everyone. Poll done. Let's see what the results are of the poll. It's coming up. You'll see results in front of you. I am ready for learning. Well, we've got most. Well, we've got 17, 50, about 60. Oh, no, that's 29. That's 100%. I was looking at the numbers instead of the percentages. People affected by COVID, it's nearly again 100%. There's about 9% who disagree. COVID has impacted my daily work routine. Well, again, we've got nearly, um, in fact, we have got 100% either strongly agree or agree. COVID has impacted my client group. Again, we've got close, about 97%, 3% um, it hasn't. And I feel positive about my future. And we have most, in most cases, people are saying almost 93% uh, are saying, yep, feel positive. And there's a few who aren't feeling so positive. And so um, I certainly reach out to those people who are feeling a little bit uncertain. I hope that today's um, webinar will provide um, some solace to people uh, when they're needing some support. And I'm, when I'm talking about people, I'm talking about you, workers, employers, and employees. Um, in regard to that. So today, what are we going to do? We're going to explore the supervisor supervisee frame. Now, if you see me look over here and down this way, it just means I'm, I'm looking at my other screen just to see where we're up to and I'm trying to track myself to make sure that I leave enough time for um, question time and so forth. Um, I was meant to have my clock on and I've realised I don't. So bear with me, talk amongst yourselves. I just need my little clock because it has a little frame on here and I can Check that we're travelling okay. Oops. So now I just need to stand for it too because it slips. There we go. Um, we're going to distinguish between supervision and management. These are different things, although you may have the role of being both a manager and a supervisor to some of your staff. And as a staff member, you might be, be supervised by both, and whether it's a clinical supervisor or not, it's, it's not really relevant to some extent, although I'll explain some, sometimes it is. Um, you might have the person who's um, supervising you is also your um, manager. I want to cultivate, cultivate a reflective practice, both in the moment or on the moment, and I'll explain the differences between those two as we go, and also to foster a commitment to care of self in order to care for others. We're notoriously poor in this sector, and by this sector I'm talking about, you know, human services, welfare, et cetera, et cetera. We're, we're extremely... Um, poor at looking after ourselves. We're good at looking after others, but we're not so good about looking after ourselves. And I think we need to give some thought to this. Um, oh, just before I go, I do understand there's another seminar Melbourne City Mission has specifically on self-care. And I'm trying not, I think it might be going right at this moment. But, well, if you're, if you're in that one, you're not in this one. If you're in this one, you're not in that one. Um, my self-care will take a little bit of a different um, twist that might surprise uh, some of you. How about this? Truth is the absence of knowledge. Now, when I was 40 years of age, I had been studying martial arts for quite some time and I was interested in proverbs and Chinese and Japanese philosophy and Buddhism and Taoism and all these Confucianism. And I kept a little book and I came across this in my little journal and I'd written, because I wanted to write proverbs, I'd written truth is the absence of knowledge. And I thought, that is really, for a 40 year old, that's not bad. That kid must have been, had some really good thoughts because when you think about it, Five or six hundred years ago, people thought the earth was flat. That was their truth. And then someone got in a boat and they went out to the horizon and they didn't fall off the edge. And all of a sudden, people had new knowledge and their truth had changed. So I'm here to say that you probably have some truth around this idea of supervision and reflective practice and self-care. I'm just asking you to open your minds to the possibility once we get through the things I'm going to talk about, that you could alter your truth in regard to this. The things that get in the way of us altering our truth tend to be our defences. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So let's have a think uh, a little bit about supervision. Um, and I've got a little poll. Who am I right now? Now, this is just, there's three people you could possibly be. And I just want you to select who you are. And I don't want you to go with 
the one you think everyone else would like because nobody can see the answers to we can't tell them you know fred said this ben said that maria melissa said this etc i just want you to tell you where you find yourself right now where do you find yourself um right now there's three of them and they're a bit long you have to read out You might be trying to go, am I this one or that one? Just, you know, whatever instinctively, whatever your gut says. Okay, close the poll, Freddie. And let's see, who are we? Who have we got? We've got about 83% um, who say they find themselves, they understand their organization's goals. Uh, work hard to help achieve them and feel motivated by what they are doing. There's a, about 15% of people who are a bit unsure about the organization's goals, sometimes work to achieve them and may be unsure by what they're doing. And there's, there's a small group of 1%, and, uh, which is one person who's not really um, finding themselves in the right place in terms of the organization, the goals, and feeling motivated to do their work. But thanks everyone for your honesty with that. Thanks, we can close that, I can close it. Oh, you did it, thanks Freddie. Um, there are three types of employers and employees that tend to operate in organizations. We have, and there's a reason I put these in a, a kind of a, a traffic light um, system. We have buyers, we have window shoppers, and we have um, complainants. And you could either be a supervisor supervising one of these people, or you could be a supervisee who has, as a supervisor, one of these people. And let's just look at them in a little more detail. Um, complainants tend to be people who are a little bit defensive. Now, by complainants, don't mistake this from someone who has a, general, uh, uh, a genuine gripe with what might be happening in the organisation. Uh, complainants uh, tend to be people who complain about everything. They're defensive, they're blaming of others, everything is somebody else's response, a responsibility, it's the organization's fault, it's my peers' fault, it's my client's fault, etc. They tend to be argumentative rather than trying to provide uh, solutions, they'll argue about solutions that other people might have offered up, and they tend to have low motivation within the environment. Now a complainant could simply be a person who has done their time within an organization, within a team, and they need some new challenges. Um, they could be a person who is simply not well physically or psychologically and finding it very hard to do the work they're expected to do. And most organisations, excuse me, <coughs> uh, it's because as this room heats up, and I heat up, I get a bit of a cough, um, uh, can have low motivation. Window shoppers, now window shoppers could be people such as um, new graduates or new staff who come into the organisation. They're not quite sure what the organisation is going to provide. They can also be staff that lack some confidence, both in their role and how they will interact with their peers, uh, both employees and employers. They can be easily led. Now, this can both be a curse and a blessing. It's a curse if they're led by complainants. It's a blessing if they're led by buyers because Window shoppers can, in fact, become buyers. Um, they tend to procrastinate, and their motivation blows hot and cold. Motivation blows hot and cold. Uh, buyers tend to be uh, those people in an organisation who are innovative, they're self-autonomous, they're resilient, and they have high self-awareness. And these, of course, are the people that we would all like to have in our organisation. And by I say we, both employers and employees, we would like to have lots and lots of buyers. In fact, you can kind of uh, look at an organisation and you can measure this and determine where the, um, what's that? I'm making this action, but I can't remember the word. What's that word, um, Freddie? Uh, seesaw, got it. Um, you can have a kind of seesaw experience in an organisation depending on where the balance um, of these types of people exist. And I just want us to, to think about this, that, that as a supervisor, or I'll just go back for a moment, as a supervisor or a supervisee, your work is going to be easier or harder depending on who comes into your room. 
who comes into your room is going to determine just how difficult the work you're going to encounter. And it doesn't matter whether you're back, back of uh, health staff or whether you're doing um, full clinical um, client work, you can end up either, as I've said, being a supervisor who's supervising anyone on this little continuum, or you can be a supervisee who is confronted by a supervisor who may not be in the right space. So let's think about the supervisee and uh, supervisor frame. Um, I, I should tell you that I, because we've only got a very short period of time, my goal is to plant some seeds on these things. Now, I've often said in training, and for those of you who came to my last uh, webinar, I had a slide that said, a whole lot of knowledge, we've all got knowledge, but the, the um, group that actually takes that knowledge and puts it into practice is actually quite small. And the bridge between knowledge and practice is in fact personal insight. So in some ways, the, per, the, the frame that you create between supervisor and supervisee is, I call it a frame, is because it's a little bit like a painting. A painting contains what's inside it. We need to create a frame <clears throat> that holds the supervisor and supervisee in a particular space so they can do some work, which I'll explain momentarily. Well, what's the point of supervision? I mean, why, why do it? Because sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes it gets left off the agenda. Uh, sometimes people think, oh, it's not fair. My supervisor doesn't show up or they keep putting it off, etc." Or the supervisor fronts and the supervisor comes to the session not prepared. And uh, if you're new to supervision, you, you might quickly be trying to save the session rather than making it the um, responsibility of the supervisee. Um, Gallup um, did a survey and they find the number one reason employees leave job is a poor relationship with their immediate supervisor. So this relationship between supervisor and supervisee is absolutely critical. Uh, it's critical to self-care, it's critical to productivity, and it's critical um, to longevity within the um, workplace. But let's have a little look. I'm going to take my jacket all off because I was cold when I first came in but I'm now warmer, so if you just bear with me. Uh, of course, if we were doing this in real, if I was in a, um, on the stage or in front of a whole lot of people physically, I'd be so far back it wouldn't look terribly big action, but if anyone's ever done anything in the movie world, you know that when you're in a camera, you know, you can see everything. If I itch my ear, you're going to see that like, oh, gee, don't itch your ear. If I was 100 metres back um, on a stage, you, you wouldn't notice it. Anyway, that's apropos of nothing. Um, so let's have a think of it. If you look at the people in the workforce, we tend to have people in, in, in particularly our sectors, we have back of house people, we have front of house administrators, we have non-clinical client contact, and we have clinical client contact. Depending where you fall in your role, and some people could be a little bit in the middle, as we'll see in the next slide, will determine whether your supervision has a focus on process or task. And if I just use, don't worry about numbers on the left, they're just to tell us things get more or less. If, <clears throat> as an example, if we think about process, now process is in a sense about what's happening to you internally in the presence of your work. And for clinical staff doing you know, therapy or group work or those sorts of things, listening, being exposed to a lot of client material, they'll have a greater need to be processing that. And I need to use that word wanker again. I'm sure because I've also been a clinician, some of the back of house staff might wonder why are those clinicians, they all sit around all day and they just seem to chat and ponder and look at their navel and gaze into the stratosphere. Uh, what they're doing is processing. And they do need time to do it as much as people sometimes on the other end of the spectrum get frustrated about it. But a back of house person doesn't need to do necessarily a lot of process work because they're not being exposed to lots of client material. Except the reason it's not at zero, they may come in one day and they've had a stressful time at home and during supervision, they need some time to just unwind a little bit and maybe to clear uh, whatever is it's going to stand in the way, it's going to act as a road blocker uh, in their work. The other one is task. So for back of house staff, focus on task is going to be quite large, much more than processing. For clinical staff, further down, it's going to be lowest. In good clinical supervision, we tend not to be focused on the tasks. We are focused on the process of the work. 
the stories that are being told, my own uh, history and interaction with the client material. When it comes to performance and accountability though, it's the same for everybody. We should not expect high levels of performance or accountability uh, for back of house staff than we would for clinical staff or anybody in between. Our, 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 account, our performance and accountability is the same. However, when it comes to risk, and in our work, the risk I'm referring to is in terms of um, uh, vicarious traumatization or compassion fatigue, CF or VT. The risk of these things increases depending on the amount of client exposure you have, or particularly client uh, um, um, material. My client room material is people telling their, uh, their stories of their traumatic lives or situations that have happened to them, whether they're children or adults in those lives. Most back of house staff uh, won't have a lot of that, but they might in passing. There might be clinicians going back and forth and talking about particular client material and they happen to hear it or they hear stories. You know, people are just standing by the water cooler or at lunchtime in the lunchroom. I've also been um, mindful to tell people you should be very careful in what space you are, you are uh, talking about or exposing client material, not just because of issues of confidentiality, but for issues of vicarious traumatization, the impact this can have when people are constantly hearing that. So as we go up the, as we go, um, we have greater exposure to client material. For front of house staff, of course, when there's receptionists, clients are coming in, some distressed uh, clients may do so, some aggressive clients might come in and they may be the first person um, to confront that. So the risk of this compassion fatigue and vicarious traumatization is huge. And so therefore part of the role of supervisor, supervisee or rather supervisor in particular, is to be able to assess from moment to moment, what is the risk for the supervisee in relation to these things. Now let's have another little look at this in a slightly more complex way. What you're seeing here, and hopefully the slides are coming up for you, you're seeing back of house staff, e.g. you know, financial officer down this down on the left, moving through to front of house admin, so somebody who might be on the phones or doing reception work, to an intake worker who might be behind the scenes, uh, but they're listening to client stories, uh, we have some people who might be doing sort of transport style work. Um, it's not clinical uh, client contact, but it is client contact. And then we have two, the next two, <coughs> excuse me, and um, the next two we're looking at case workers or case managers who might um, be exposed to clinical material, but their major focus of the work is not a clinical or um, they, might, they might be a person who does some practical client work, but some of it might be of a clinical nature. That is, you're expected to talk to clients about their stories and try and help them through some of their personal problems. And then we have, of course, people who are having regular client contact, and that might be of a clinical nature. So think of therapists, counsellors, uh, people doing group work or running groups, even if it's a parenting group or something like that. So from the supervisor's point of view, what we're deciding in supervision is, is the work I'm doing about performance and skill development with my supervisee, or is it more about insight and personal development, that is developing one's uh, mind? You notice there's some percentages across that, they're gonna become clearer why I have those here. Well, the answer to that is a bit dependent on whether you are about task management in your um, supervisory role or about um, clinical processing. And as a rule of thumb, I've put across the bottom the sort of percentages dependent on the role you have in the organisation. I say it's a rule of thumb because it could change from circumstance to circumstance. As an example, people, because of the circumstances we live in at the moment, when they're with their supervisors, they may have a greater need at the moment to be processing, not necessarily in, a, in terms of clinical information, but to be processing the stresses of this current pandemic and the impact it's having, having on their um, lives. Someone who normally comes to the office, uh, front of house, uh, sorry, um, um, back of house, financial officer, who's now having to work from home. Their children are also at home because they can't go to school. Their partner's working from home and they only have one real, real space with which all that's going to happen somehow. That can huge heightened levels of, um, of stress. 
Um, from a supervisee's point of view, uh, if you're again down back of house, you might be more uh, interested in preparing your session around what it is you're doing, the task management, here are the things I'm doing, here are the things that are challenging me. If we're talking about clinical process, then you're going to be more of the being that you and supervisor, supervisee and supervisor, are spending more time in the space and reflecting on the clinical material. As I said, this can change, but as a rule of thumb, as a supervisee, if you are, for instance, our financial officer that I've been using as the example, if you're going into your supervision with your supervisor, and they want to spend 90% of their time um, sort of being and doing processing work, and then you could probably think, oh, that's not quite what I'm looking for in supervision. I need to focus on my, my tasks. If you're way down the other end, you're a therapist or counsellor or group worker, and your supervisor with you is just sp spending all the time or the majority of the time talking about, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done this? Have you done that? The sort of practical things around your work the chances are that supervisor is not going to meet your needs. Of course, one of the dilemmas in, super, in this relationship between supervisor and supervisee within organisations is you don't necessarily get to choose who your supervisor is going to be and who your supervisee is going to be. It's just a given. Irrespective, in this process, in the frame of the supervision, both right across the spectrum, we need to develop the ability for people to um, self-reflect. And why is that so? We will talk about a little bit later, but basically the, the skill of self-reflecting is the way in which you're able to use your mind to focus both on your work and the implications of that work in relation to the rest of your life. And in some sense, if you were sort of being uh, very concrete about it, we're saying, uh, can I reflect, am I working to the best of my abilities? Is my motivation high? Am I productive? I've got a little check-in. Where do I sit on the continuum? I'm just trying to find out who are the people. And so, um, uh, I was going to call you Frankie, Freddie. Sorry, Freddie, I do apologise. Um, Freddie's got this, um, where do I sit on the continuum? I'm just asking you, what is your role uh, in your organisation at the moment? If you can't find one that fits, don't worry about it. Um, at the end, I thought I should have put another in in case you fall into other. But see where you can most closely align yourselves. Give you 10 more seconds. Thank you, Freddie. And the results are in. Drum roll, please. So we've got 5% um, of people there aren't doing client work. That's great. 14% uh, non-client work with occasional client phone calls. 6% uh, doing non-clinical work, um, sorry, um, doing things like intake. We've got 8% who are doing non-clinical um, client work, but practical support. 5% um, um, clinical work involves both practical and, um, but the, um, sorry, I'm going to read that. So I've got to get close to the screen. Client work that involves clinical material that is not the main focus of the role, we've got five. We've got a huge group who are doing client work split between practical support, client intervention, nearly 50%, nearly half of the group that are here today. And in terms of uh, doing purely client work, we've got 14%. So we've got a, it's great because we've got a spread. So everything we're talking about is going to work right across the spread. Thanks, Freddie, we can close that and I'll move across. Again, a, a sort of rule of thumb, when we think about supervision, we are generally thinking about process, where we're thinking about management, we're thinking about um, performance. Now how does this, what does this mean in sort of the real world? Well, supervision is about how you use your mind and the processing of your work. And that includes even if you're back of, back of health. Management is more about 
how you perform your tasks and the performance of your work. Am I being productive? Am I meeting my KPIs? Excuse me, if you happen to have um, KPIs. The interesting question that I have, and it's an age-old conundrum, is can your manager be your supervisor? And so I just, I just want to see if I ask this as a question and you can put it in the, um, I ask you the question, so you can write in the chat room, can your manager be your supervisor? By the way, this is my favourite slide. I hope you're seeing all the beautiful red things twinkling through. It took me a long time to get that one to work. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my square, um, my square, my screen for a moment because I'm interested in people's opinions in this in the chat room. Can your supervisor be your manager? Oh, someone said wanky is fine. That was before. Let's see, what have we got? Uh, someone just said yes. Thanks, Linda. No, I don't believe it works effectively. Thanks, Jean. Great. Okay, so we're interesting. We've already got both ends of the continuum. On one side, we've got people saying, yeah, it's fine. Other people saying, well, I'm not sure about that. Oh, they're coming in fast, and what have we got? I've got a, uh, whew, I won't go names. My manager manages, and I am a clinician. No, it's poor fit. It would work if they were reflective, okay? So interesting, we're talking about the skills here that are required and different aspects of, um, of the supervisee, supervisee relationship. Um, they can, but should they, someone says, and they've answered their own question and said no. Um, depends on the style of leadership. That's a really interesting one. If we put leadership into the pool, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, I don't think so. Depends on who your manager is. Um, they often are, but it isn't always effective. I think the balance is sort of towards probably not, but it's a bit dependent on who the person is. Now, I'm, I'm, that's just gleaning where we, um, someone agreed with somebody else, but I can't, oh, there we go. Not if the manager is doing performance reviews, that might make a worker vulnerable to disclose impact of work. <clears throat> really great um, comment to make because as, as very often as the manager is the one doing those performance reviews, and if you're in this kind of supervisory relationship too, particularly if you're closer up to the clinical end, all of a sudden you have to have these um, discussions. Now I can tell you, I have been in this position. I, I am a clinician at heart, but because I founded this organisation, I have been the, the, the leader of it, the CEO of this organisation, doing clinical work and also providing both management and, and supervision. And I can tell you, it is very, very difficult, not impossible, but extremely difficult to do all of those. And to some degree, uh, it, it has an impact on you, the supervisor, but in particular, it makes it very difficult for the supervisee to be clear when they come into the room, who are you? Who are you? I'm just going to go back to show you my screen. Which one is it? That one. So let's have a little think about this. So we've got back to where the sort of job roles we have and we've got people right across the spectrum, which is really great to see in this webinar. And here's the answer. If your role is around doing and performing, it's much easier for your supervisor and manager to be the same person. It progressively gets more difficult as you start to be exposed to um, clinical work or clinical material, uh, client material. Because in the process of processing that client material, um, if you've got good supervision, you will be talking about some of your own history. And you might be talking about things that um, you wouldn't normally speak of within your organisation. As an example, if you held a belief that a certain, just because of how you've lived in the world and it could have been subliminal, which I'm gonna use this as a slightly different example. A friend of mine who came from Africa over 30 years ago from South Africa, he told me he was, a, he was a, um, um, an Anglo-Saxon person. He told me it took him 10 years before he could conceive that he could actually uh, marry um, so, uh, a South African. Um, indigenous person that he could have a relationship it took him 10 years now this is a person who is in fact a social worker had been a social worker in these communities had been a social worker 
but subliminally he held um, this belief. He didn't even really know about it until, in fact, he was in supervision um, with me in the early days. But he needed to talk about it. He needed to work it through to understand how this had become that part. Now, that's a hard thing to do if the person you're talking to is your manager, supervisor, might be doing your performance reviews, and you're having to do, discuss things that might be really, really difficult to discuss. Um, if we have a look at the supervisor or supervisee relationship, it has to develop. For those of you who are new to supervision, that is, you've now become a supervisor, or if it's your first time as a supervisee, that is, getting supervision of this of the type we might be referring to, there's actually a process you have to go, um, go through in order to form a kind of a, a working relationship. We're in this together and you have a frame around yourselves with which uh, to hold the work that you're going to do together. Um, the first part of that relationship, when you first come together, I call it, I've just said recon, but that stands for reconnaissance, reconnaissance and intelligence gathering. People check each other out. And what they're really trying to work out is, are you a safety threat? And this is both supervisee, supervisor, by the way. You both do it to each other. It may not happen as um, uh, concretely as I'm describing it, but it will happen even if it at an unconscious level. Are you a safety threat to me? Can you harm me physically or psychologically? Are you, are you an easy mark? Are you going to perhaps, because of the way I present, you won't challenge me on stuff? I can get away with stuff if I'm the supervisor, or if even I'm the supervisor, I can get away with saying, oh, look, let's not have supervision, let's go and have a cup of coffee instead down in a, in a cafe. Um, are you um, um, a, irrelevant? That is, you, I look at you and I think you've got nothing to offer me. How can you're my supervisor and you're 27 and I'm 35 and I've been doing this work many more years than you, what have you got to offer? And the final one is the interpersonal threat. The fact that as a person says, I think you have something to offer me, I think this could work well, but I need to check it out. And so what happens, <clears throat> and both supervisor and supervisee will do this, and again, I'm playing with this um, traffic light kind of thing. This is tentative, the yellow one is tentative, reconnaissance intelligence gathering period is tentative. Is this relationship going to work or not? Uh, we have this concept of border incursions, that is, uh, people are going to test each other, and they can be very subtle tests. I don't know if you noticed, it nearly fell over there. <clears throat> very subtle tests. A supervisee may um, turn up late to supervision. They may turn up not prepared. Uh, the supervisor may, of course, change times. They say, look, I really believe in regular times and so forth, and then you keep getting these changes all the way through. Uh, from week to week or not available, etc. Ultimately, what people are trying to do is, is do this little dance to work out whether, in fact, we can join together and instill this as an important relationship between each other with mutual respect and a mutual focus on what the work's going to be in this relationship. To do this, uh, it's important that we create this frame. Remember, I was talking about the frame around the picture where you can contain whatever's inside. So some things for you to think about. <clears throat> One, find a regular time slot that doesn't change unless it's absolutely exceptional circumstances. Now there's a neurological reason for this, believe it or not. And the neurological reason is this. When you form patterns in the brain, the brain prepares for whatever's coming. If you have a regular time for your supervision, <clears throat> Monday at 10 o'clock, Monday at 10 o'clock, the person naturally before Monday at 10 o'clock, the brain will get prepared. If you chop and change, the brain actually gets a bit anxious because it's not sure what's happening. And it keeps having to do this gear shift. Oh, Monday's nine, no, it's tomorrow's Tuesday. Okay, well, it's very hard to do. Ensure your room is conducive to supervision. Uh, think about the light. Notice I've got a light there behind me, just putting a little bit of light in different areas. Think about the things you have in your room. Do they add something to it? Because um, um, objects, paintings and the like can help people to ground themselves. Comfortable seating. Now, some of you might be cringing out there, I know. You might be thinking, oh, I don't have 
we don't think about that space or we just sort of find a room wherever we can find it. It's actually important if you can find the same room each time, that is also um, unhelpful. Now, some people think, well, we don't have the money to create nice spaces like that. So um, I was asked to consult with an organisation around their um, counselling rooms. They had 11 of them. No, 10. 10. And they had a little waiting area. And this was in, in one of um, Australia's biggest um, providers of kind of human services work, social work, uh, welfare work, etc., psychology counselling. And they had this space in Melbourne and they asked me to come and have a look at it. And they were really worried about it. And they should have been because when I went into it, the waiting room had chairs and a kind of a horseshoe um, space. And if you sat on this side and someone sat on that side, their knees would um, bump together. That's, that's what the waiting room was like. So really clients coming into that space, rather than being able to sort of be ready for the work they were going to do with their therapist, uh, they were already feeling a bit anxious because of the in, um, proximity everyone was sitting in this room. They also had some shelving that just had post um, brochures and pamphlets and a whole lot of gunk which funnily enough, uh, some of the pamphlets literally had not been used for years and they were fallen over and all over the place. And then when I went into the um, counselling rooms, um, literally when I opened the door and I turned the light on, my eyes hurt. They had fluorescent lights. Uh, we've taken a lot. We've still got some, but we've taken, as the lights go, the fluorescent lights have go, go, gone in our current office. We've take, started taking some out. Um, just to change the lighting and the mood and the space. They were really worried and I said, yeah, it's not a great space at all. It's not conducive to the work that needs to happen. I went away and I came back and I gave them some feedback and they were saying, we just don't have the money. And I said, well, how much money do you have to make a change? And I said, how much do we need, do you think? And I said, $50. I said, if you've got $50, you can change the space. And so what I got them to do is buy a lamp for each of the counselling rooms from Ikea. They had these $5 lamps. They put a lamp in each. They turned off the fluorescent light, lights and put a lamp. Um, they then went to some op shops and they got some pottery pieces. And they placed them in the bookcase instead of having all these brochures and pamphlets and things. Most people do go online. If, you, if someone really needs them, you can offer them or have them in a little stand. So there are things we can do to shift this. Should be low noise interference. I know some people have spaces where there's no thought to noise reduction. I have been in rooms and spaces where I've been providing some consultation. I can hear what's going on in the next room and the room over there, which is, um, it distracts us from the work. And no mobile phones in room or out on table. Now, the reason for that, so I can't even follow the ones there. The reason for that, I've had people come in who I'm supervising and they put their mobile phone down on a table or a side chair or something, side table, <clears throat> and they say, it's all right, mobile phone's off. And of course, off doesn't really mean off, does it? Because if it was really off, they don't need it beside them. They mean it's silent. And of course, when, when a message comes in, the uh, screen lights up. And so I've found when people put it down there, as soon as it lights up, what happens? People, including myself, go, oh, it's a message. If you have that happen four or five times during supervision, it's problematic. Um, I'm a big believer that I don't know why, but we don't really need uh, mobile phones around us when we're doing um, um, this work, unless there's some safety um, um, issue. And finally, supervision should be therapeutic in approach, but it's not therapy. It's therapeutic in approach, not, um, not therapy. There are times when I'll be talking with somebody about something that I see has risen in the supervisee that I have them reflect or think about a little bit in terms of where has this come from in their life. And if it should flow out, you know, they might be in tears talking about it. I will spend time, of course, empathising and trying to are keeping it contained, and then we talk about what do they need to do with that, which might be to actually go into therapy or seek counselling. But my role as the supervisor is not to be their therapist. So who's responsible for what in this relationship? First, supervisors, set a regular time and protect it, prepare your mind in the frame and turn up on time. Supervisees, prepare your mind to be opened, know what you want to use the session for. It's your responsibility as a supervisee 
to work out how you want to use the session. It's not the supervisors. You should not turn up to supervision not having thought about what it is you want to get out of it. And of course, turn up on time. So let's think about a little bit about reflective practice because we want to use the skills of reflective practice um, in our work, uh, in our, in our, um, both our work and also in that uh, relationship between supervisor and supervisee. But basically, uh, supervision is developing your ability to use your mind. If you're a caseworker, um, youth worker, welfare worker, social worker, psychologist, therapist, counsellor, art therapist, whoever you are, we're not like carpenters who have, you know, they have a belt on them and they've got hammers and they've got nails and they've got chisels and they've got saws and power saws for bigger jobs, etc. The only thing we really have, excuse me, the only thing we really have is this tool. It's our minds. And if your mind is not reflexive and reflective, um, there are going to be issues uh, in your work. As an example, let's think about reflective practice for a moment. So some of us are better out of it, that's the plus. Some of us not so good, that's the minus. And I've discovered over 40 years of work that it tends to fall along that continuum of complainants, window shoppers, buyers. Now, just so people think, oh, you're trying to see yourself as special, you see yourself as a buyer. I have been a complainant in an organisation. I have been a complainant. And I knew then it was time to get out, it was time to move on. These things are personality trait and attitude driven. From the supervisor's point of view, if you are supervising someone who's a complainant, you'll have high effort for, for very small benefit. You'll have very small benefit when you're dealing with a complainant. And very often these people either need to decide, are they in the right organisation at this time? Have they, have they got the right role? Or do they need to get some therapeutic help outside the organisation? Uh, window shoppers, it's high to medium effort and depending on their motivation. As I said before, because they're easily led, if they get a supervisor who's a buyer, they might be able to mentor them and to become a buyer themselves. And finally, these are the people I love to supervise. It's low effort. And by low effort, I don't mean you put your hands back and put your feet up but they come into supervision sessions prepared. They're really reflective. When I offer a challenge to them, they don't go, no, 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 I've got an excuse about that. No, that wasn't me. They actually say, I need to think about that. It's a great question. I've never thought about that. Um, they see this a relationship between supervisor and supervisee as a shared responsibility. And there's high benefit with supervision with these people. There's high benefit because they tend to be very productive. They get good client outcomes get good client out outcomes, and a great ability to reflect. Now, when we think about um, reflecting, we can reflect at two different times in our work. We can reflect in the moment, that is when we're doing the client work, or we're doing some piece of work. Again, our financial officer in the back, they can reflect in the moment. How am I going to solve this problem? It's a big one. I can't get this budget to... Um, the bottom line to um, whatever that phrase is they say with budgets, I should know that, it's gone out of my mind. Freddie, help me out, what's the thing you do with budgets? You have to, um, it's gone out of my mind. Anyway, it doesn't matter. In the moment. Or on the moment is when you're reflecting on something that's happened. So in supervision, you tend to reflect on the moment, on the client work you were doing, or on the um, task you were doing earlier that day or last week that you, you were getting stuck and you were not sure how to solve it. We have different um, forms of um, self-reflection. We have that down the bottom, it says reflective, uh, uh, your ability to use, to gain insight when you're having a discussion about something, but also your ability to be more reflexive, that is to be intuitive. In the moment when we're doing our client work or actually focused on whatever work we happen to be doing, we want to be access our more reflect, reflexive part the intuitive part of ourselves, because we don't always have an opportunity to reflect more consciously in the moment of the work. As an example, if a kid happened to come up and say, fuck off, you can't tell me what to do. I'm not going to do that. Um, it's a lot harder to be calmly reflective. You almost need to know, have this stuff embedded so well in you, it's almost habitual, and you can be ref um, reflexive. Intuit, what's the, I need to empathise. 
gee, you've got some big feelings here at the moment. Whew, I didn't realize. So in your work, there are two parts to this. When I'm doing the work, how do I use my mind? How do I use my mind to, to solve the issues, confront the issues, to do the work that I'm faced with? And when I'm in my supervision, um, how do I use my mind to think about the things that I've done and what impact I've had on me? And what impact I've had on me. So why do we need to be reflective? Let's um, just stop sharing for a moment. There's a question there. Let's see if people can come up. Why, why should we? Why should we be reflective? Um, if you go back to your little chat screens, let's see what people can come up with. See what they have. Just see if some things. Why do we need to be reflective for? To grow and learn. I like that one, growth. So two people already are talking something about growth. So self-reflection is something to do with personal growth. Um, to develop your professional practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Supervision to extent is about that, developing my professional practice. Uh, some people will tell you that you can sort of, oh, hold on a minute, um, they'll say, don't bring your personal life into your professional work. And somehow, miraculously, we're meant to suddenly split ourselves and say, I don't have any personal life and come into my professional work and be this um, effective worker. To those people who think you have to split like that, I say, Pfft. you cannot separate your professional and personal lives. But what you can do is have self-awareness to know when your personal life is having an impact on your professional work. What else do we have here? Dude, we've got lots of them coming through fast and thick and fast. Uh, test assumptions, love that. Give you a chance to see things differently and more openly. Give ourselves space. Yes, we do need space, particularly as I said, we clinical staff, we need a kind of often a bit more space than most. Um, improve conflict management strategies within the workplace. Yes, you've got a problem with a peer, good place to be able to say, how am I going to solve this um, issue? So that you're aware of the impact of your own stuff on your client work and not to more, do more harm. Absolutely like this. Um, our job is to do no harm, but in fact, to do good. We don't want to be going into our work and doing uh, more harm. What else do we have? To help make our work in the sector sustainable longer term and prevent burnout. Love that. Absolutely. Um, this kind of work that allows us to take whatever's in here and to bring it out gives us longevity over time. And we'll talk a bit about that when we're talking about um, self-care. Improve further learning. Love that, Lisa. What, what did Lisa, someone said, love that, Lisa. I'm looking to see what Lisa said, but I can't quite, I can't find it quickly enough. Oh, Leah, to help um, make our work in the sector more sustainable. Yeah, see, that's what I spoke about. Well done. Good comments. Let me just share my screen again uh, with my, hey, what do you think about this beautiful gorilla? You can actually see that he or she, I'm not quite sure which, uh, is deep in thought. Um, so what do we need a bit? Um, some comments that I've made in relation to this in particular, so we don't get caught in what I refer to as Cartman's drama triangle. Some of you may not have heard, heard about this before, but there's a dance that can go on between supervisor, supervisee, and others. And this is how it works. A supervisee or a supervisor takes up the role of victim. Think complainant. Oh, my life, no one understands, things are terrible, I'm not getting what I need. Um, etc. The organisation doesn't provide me. Now, of course, some of these complaints that people might have might be real, but they tend to not do it in that way of being uh, kind of the world is terrible and I can't do anything about it. Um, if, you have a, if you do have a person who's a victim like this, then often, often what they'll do is they'll look for two other people. They'll look for someone who's going to be their rescuer, saviour or colluder. And it could be you, the supervisor. The supervisor could say to the supervisor, yeah, I know, I'm, I have the same issue too. You know, that boss over there, that senior manager is terrible. And what happened is that senior manager becomes the persecutor. How terrible are they? How terrible are they? This is a dangerous triangle to be in for anybody. And as a supervisor in particular, you need to, if you think you're being pulled into it, you need to get out of it. And the way you get out of it is by naming the dance. By naming the dance. You have to challenge, if your, if your supervisee is coming across as this victim, nothing I can do, everyone's horrible. You need to bring that alive into the space and talk about it and work it through. You want to get rid of Cartman's Triangle out of your organisation. Cartman's Triangle will destroy teams. 
absolutely destroy teams. You can have a team of 10 people where seven of them are doing fantastic work and you've got three people caught in a carpenter's triangle and it will have an impact across the whole team and it can have an impact across the whole um, organisation. Across the whole organisation. So remember that self-reflective uh, self, um, practice is about the way in which you use your mind. Now, I'm not telling you how to go about developing that. I can tell you how I developed it in my work. There are two places I developed it. I developed it in my own therapy over a number of years. And I developed it with good mentors, supervisors. And once you develop good ability for self-reflection, it sort of becomes automatic. You do it all the time. You can be walking along the street. I did it last night. I um, spoke to my wife. She happens to be a psychoanalyst, um, which uh, interesting psychologist, psychoanalyst staying in the same room. I sort of wake up in the morning and I say to her, well, you're okay. How am I? Boom, boom. Sorry, bad joke, I know. Okay, anyway, move around from self-care. So we've got a, <coughs> excuse me, we've got a poll four. What is it? What is self-care? Thanks, Freddie, if we can put that poll up. Looking after yourself, what you're going to do just to keep you safe, the way you maintain, blah, blah, blah. See, so what do you think? You can only choose one. So you can have to think, which is the best fit? Which is the best fit? I'll count down to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Thanks, Freddie. Let's close the poll. Here we go. Drum roll. Okay, we've got 37% says looking after yourself. What organise it does to keep you safe? Zero, that's good. The way you maintain your homeostasis to maximise your physical and psychological output? 33, that's big. Doing stuff you want to do without your body and mind? Uh, giving up? 6%. A mutual obligation between employer and employee? I think that employee should be there. I don't know if we missed it out. Being able to eat a donut when you I love that. There were, uh, one person said being able to eat a donut when you um, feel you <laughs> when you like to. I love it. Um, can just close that poll. The interesting thing from my point of view, we romanticise self care. We say it's all about love and hope. And I'm sorry, I'm here to be sort of the one that goes humbug, humbug, humbug. Look, the bottom line is. Every single person, I'm sure, even in this webinar, you know what you need to do to look after your own self-care. Most of you, I'm assuming, are um, at the least um, cert forth, um, et cetera, in, in your learnings, if not degree-leveled people, possibly multiple degrees. You know how to do self-care. It's not the doing, it's not the things that you should do about what food you put into your body or how much do you exercise and look after your physical and spiritual minds. It's not about that. So I'm not going to tell you about what you should do. You know what you need to do. I'm more interested about what it is, why it is that people don't do it. The way you maintain your internal homeostasis, so this is what I'm suggesting it is, so those 33%, good choice. And um, those other things are true, even the donut one. You know, if you feel you need something, you don't want to be so, oh, I can't have this donut, it'll be terrible, horrible things will happen, eat the donut, enjoy it. Just don't eat 10 at the same time. The way you maintain your internal homeostasis to maximise your physical and psychological output. Another way to say this is doing the stuff you want to do without your body and mind giving up and shutting down. In a nutshell, that's self-care. <coughs> Excuse me, doing the stuff you want to do without your body and mind giving up and shutting down. So who's responsible for it? Well, employers are legally responsible for creating a safe and healthy environment. It's interesting in organisations that people don't own, such as Melbourne oh, City Missions, as an example, who is the employer? Because everybody in the organisation is actually, even the CEO, is an employee at some point. So there are some dual roles that go on. In Australian Childhood Trauma Group, I'm both the employer, I own the organisation, but I'm also an employee because I have to follow all the, I get paid and I have to follow all the uh, policies and procedures. Employees are contractually responsible to turn up to work in a state where they can function and meet their KPIs. It's not the employer's responsibility. If you go partying on the weekend, which is a bit harder to do at the moment, 
But if you go hard partying on the weekend and you turn up to work on Monday and you're sort of in a bit of a you know, fog, or you don't turn up to work on Monday because you've got a hangover, that's on you. It's not on the employer. So in my belief, there's a, I talk about self-care mutual obligation. The self-care mutual obligation. As an employer, I'm giving you a job. I'm paying you, and hopefully I'm doing the right thing, I'm like some organisations, and paying the right amount of money at least, or above the award. <clears throat> giving you a safe environment with which to work. This, the self-care mutual obligation, if you need to know where that is, it should be in your um, governed in your organisation by your policies, processes and procedures. From the employer point of view, you're responsible to give access to your policies, processes and procedures about staying safe within the work um, environment. When I'm talking about staying safe, of course I'm referring to not being put in harm's way whether it be physically such as there's poor lighting, you have to strain up against the screen to, to read your screen, or um, going out to see a client who you know might be violent, uh, violent or volatile and not having a safety plan in place. The employee, though, needs to take responsibility for enacting the policies, procedures and uh, processes and procedures in their work environment. They need to take responsibility but the employer has to make sure that they've done the right thing by showing, having access for employers um, with regard to these things. Now, <clears throat> as I've said, when it comes to this, again, about the supervisee supervisor relationship, with complainants in relationship, they often turn up to work when it suits them. You'll have window shoppers who will turn up to work, but performance will be a bit sketchy. And the risk for buyers is they turn up to work and actually work too hard. And sometimes we think that's great, you know, they work extra hours and they'll work on weekends and so forth. <clears throat> we have to watch buyers as much as we watch complainants in relation to self-care. Because each of these things is an indicator that things aren't going so well. And ultimately it all comes together in supervision. We've come the whole circle. Reflective practice, self-care comes together in supervision. What it is you do within uh, that relationship to ensure that the person you are supervising is as well physically, psychologically and spiritually as they can be, <clears throat> so they can do the work. And that supervisee, in that supervision, if they've agreed to the contract, and if that supervisee believes a supervisor has something to offer me, then you have to be courageous and offer things up uh, in your supervision. I'm, I'm going to finish on this taking the pulse. I think we do this poorly. We sometimes track outcomes, possibly for our clients. And we might even once a year do an organisational, sort of bigger organisation of how are people going, and then go, oh, we've done that. <clears throat> but what we're not good at, I think even for clients, but what we're not good at sitting for workers is in fact, taking their pulse through their journey in the organisation. It should happen partly in supervision, but sometimes my belief is it should happen a bit independently. So I'm just showing you here, we developed some technology called Ripple that allows us to do this, um, to track uh, both organisational wellbeing and we can do it individually. Individually is much more difficult. Um, I won't talk about that here now, but it's much more difficult to get people in an organisation to say how they're going, particularly with um, somebody who can see it. But it can happen in the supervisor or supervisee relationship. And this is a particular framework. We can put all sorts of frameworks into Ripple. This is one of the ones we used. And if you can see behind that big white thing I put there, how do we really know we are okay? You notice that sleep and concentration are in the red. This is actually showing me very clearly what the themes are in this person's life. And it gives us an opportunity then to talk about how we're going to um, think about or how can we support you in changing this. Because the sleep stuff, in fact, may be to do with what's going on at home, but the concentration is having impact in the work. We can do this with entire organisations. So here's, here's an example where we have um, every um, quarter uh, this organisation we're working with is doing a ripple. 
Um, everyone sees us straight away, by the way, so it's very transparent. And my belief is organisational wellbeing should be transparent so that we encourage everybody in the organisation to think about and take some responsibility. But what's it's doing here is that if you look where that little dot is, that's the overall, oops, overall wellbeing of the organisation. And the big red to blue, that's the spread of the results. So here there are some people who are really unhappy and there are some people who are really, really happy. And, and that's quite normal. <clears throat> we can delve down so we can click on one of these months and we can go down and we can see where is this impact. Lo and behold, work-life management and job, job satisfaction. Now what I can tell you is if you look at the date, this was taken in May 12th, 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. And people were trying to adjust to working from home and they were struggling with it. And we also had people who were having to change the way they worked with clients in a way that they normally wouldn't work and it created a whole lot of um, challenges. We can also see, and it's all anonymous, we can see who's at high risk, how many people there are. We can see who's medium level risk and we can also see who's at lower risk. Those ones are the ones who are doing really well uh, within the organisation. Um, so there are ways we can do this and I'm, I'm suggesting to you both as in that supervisee-supervisee relationship you should find a way with which you can take the pulse on a regular basis. I actually think from my point of view, particularly during this pandemic, but even generally, um, we should take the pulse of workers at least once a week in this work, at least once a week. So we can intervene, um, we can intervene early. So we have time for some questions. Um, where is my little stop sharing? I'm really keen um, to see some questions. Now, there are two ways you can do this in these where are the Q&A? Oh, I've lost my Q&A. I think you can see it, Freddie. I can't <clears throat> see it. You can either type a question, or I'd love to have some interaction. Or I mean, it doesn't have to be a question. You might have a comment to make. I'd love to have some interaction. So you can turn off your mics. Um, I think there's a way to put your hand up. Am I right, Freddie? There's a little thing. I don't have it, but you might have it, where you can put your hand up and <clears throat> say, I've got a question. And then please speak out. Don't be afraid. Um, we've got, oh, sorry, we've got one here. Um, uh, Eric was going to answer this question. Oh, so it's a good question. Just, someone did ask, how do we translate this frame, COVID times, when we have supervision sessions on Zoom? You know, it's a, it's a great question because, <clears throat> as I said to you, um, at, at least on, on Zoom, if you're doing supervision, you can see the person. I can't see any of you. You're just some of your fleeting names. And so it can be quite um, intimidating. It's not easy. The thing that's missed with Zoom is your ability to feel the person. I don't mean physically. Uh, I'm talking about the energy that's given off, that we give off of human beings. Um, Freud talked about it as transference. Uh, other therapists talk about projection. Um, when we're in a space, we feel that energy. It's much more difficult to do, but we can do it. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about Zoom is that we tend to be much closer in. So we can get better at reading faces. We can see that energy in faces. So that's absolutely one way to do it. The other one is, to, as I said, you take the pulse. You find a way to do that on a regular basis. You take the pulse of the person. And when you come into supervision, you actually have that information there with which you can talk um, openly about it. Um, <clears throat> there's no magic about this stuff in relation to Zoom because it's challenging us all in our work, uh, whether it's Zoom or Skype or Teams or Slack or whatever you're using. It is a challenge to us. However, a good supervisor will be able to pick up on the nuances even across um, cyberspace. Um, right, questions. I just want to answer that. How do you prepare? Ah, is that different from the one above? How do you prepare the safe space of supervision during COVID? whilst on Zoom, it's kind of the same, but talking about how do you, how do you make it safe? So I do have a, I do have a thought about this. Um, it's important if you're working from home, you need to find a quiet space, even if you have to go into your bedroom. You need to go somewhere where you're not going to get those interruptions, and that's both a supervisee and supervisor. You cannot have interruptions. And this can be stressful. I'll tell my own circumstances. My wife is, as I said, psychoanalyst, so she spends a lot of time just with another person at the moment, she's having to do that work on the phone. The first um, run of um, COVID in terms of the wave, first wave, uh, we both worked from home and she was in another space. 
but it didn't work, even though she was in another space and I was having my routine, we'd bump into each other and I was distracting her frame, and she was distracting mine. <clears throat> so she's now back in the office. At least um, we've worked out the two, two very long days, which is patients from seven in the morning through to six at night. She's gone to the office to, to sit with herself. It saved our marriage. It saved our marriage. So in the second, we kind of learned from it. So I think you really have to be open to learning about um, this experience, about what's happened, and to talk about it together as supervisor, your supervisor. Um, Hi, could you quickly summarize the approach you take with complainants? Whoa, quickly. <laughs> I wish I could um, uh, do that quickly. <clears throat> here's, the, here, here's the rule of thumb. Usually it's a bit to do with where my relationship is with that person. If I've had a long standing relationship, <clears throat> excuse me, with a person who's either a complainant or has become a complainant, and I think that relationship's strong enough when we're in, to, in that joining together phase, we're not in the reconnaissance intelligence gathering or in the um, uh, um, border incursions phase, if we're in that joining together, then often what I do is I simply put it on the table. I will say, hey, Sarah, we've, we've spent now three sessions and each time you've come in with these complaints, but I, I haven't seen um, within you an ability or some choices around thinking about what you can do. It seems to be about everybody else. Now, if, it's, if the person can engage in that, then there's a bit of hope. But I have to tell you very often with complainants, it's not easy. There's a point where you'll get to where it becomes performance management. And that most of us in this area, because we like each other, we don't want to do that. We're not good at it. You know, you didn't become a therapist or a youth worker or a welfare worker to have to oversee someone and say, look, we don't like the way you're going about your work and you need to change it. It's, it's hard. It's really hard for everyone. Um, can you speak a little more about being a manager and a supervisor and any tips? Okay. So if you are a manager and a supervisor, here's a couple of things that I think are really important that you take. You need to separate out and make it very clear, preferably not in the same session, but if it happens to be, what stuff's management and what's about supervision? You've got to separate it. Now, I've, I've been in this position where I make it clear when I'm in supervision with um, um, normally it's clinicians for me, or was, I say this is about supervision. And on the alternate week or fortnight, depending on how often this is happening, we might have a session that's about task management performance. So I separate it out. It works best if there is a mutual respect between both people. That is, I'm not trying to get you. I'm trying to improve and build you. Um, but it is challenging. There are no two ways about it. It's challenging. But you need to find a way of separating without what I call splitting. We're not psychologically splitting. We're just separating out those two tasks to have them at different times, preferably. <coughs> um, could we summarise the approach you take? I've cleared, done that one. So I've just got to read, it's a bit hard to read. Uh, how influential should a supervision template be to a supervision? I have most experiences using them. Okay. I'm going to say something controversial here, and please forgive me, Melbourne City Mission or other organisations are there. I think we tend to have templates when we are less, uh, either they're forced upon us or less skilled at knowing what the work is in supervision. They can add to the frame, don't get me wrong, they can add to the frame, here's what we're doing. But if, particularly if you're doing processing work, template's not very helpful. Template's not very helpful. If you're doing task-focused work, you know, template, you can sort of tick off things, you know, it, it can work. But <clears throat> because um, the more clinical processing is about what's going on in the here and now, it's not about have I talked about that or that, it's what's happening in the relationship as a supervisor, I'm going to be thinking about what is it that the supervisor is saying and how do I reflect that back to them and think about where we go with it. I don't want to be distracted by a template. Um, but unfortunately, we now have some clunky um, um, expectations around this stuff. Normally, if I have supervision, rather than template, what I do is then I write up notes after the supervision. That's why I have a 50-minute supervision session, not one hour. 50 minutes is the work. 
10 minutes as, me as a supervisor is me taking notes and 10 minutes for the supervisee should be then taking notes. It's a 15 minutes psychologist's um, hour. Just an, oops, just an observation, approximately half of our team are attending one-on-one -on -one clinical supervision voluntarily. And those that are seem to be navigating the current climate well and remaining quite healthy buyers. I just want to work one on one clinical attending one on one clinical. I'm, I'm not sure when they say voluntary, I'm not sure if you mean they're doing it externally because we actually didn't talk about that. Because <clears throat> one of the issues around management supervision, and this is a budgetary thing, that what you can do is have your clinical staff um, get external supervision, or you can buy in an external supervisor just to come in a day a week. Um, with which to um, provide supervision for your clinical staff. And then clearly their manager is just on about management and task. That's one way to do it. Actually, quite a good way. You can also buy in um, group supervision. Um, we run for the clinical staff. We've run for some time uh, a thing called Valent Group, which is a, a way of presenting um, client information or um, stories, client material. Um, so people can work through it and learn uh, about their cases. <clears throat> what else should most organisations do to support and care and self-care apart from food? Yeah, EAPs are an interesting thing. We have them because it's expected that you have them. But if the, the bottom line is very few employees use them. About, around about two, most are around about two or three percent. Um, you might get some other or people if they're more encouraging or a bit more self-reflective, use their mind, you get about six percent. <clears throat> but you also are often at very short term, you'll tend to get more solutions focused, sort of cognitive behavioural therapy types of intervention. If someone's dealing with something that's very deeply embedded in them, those approaches won't necessarily um, be the most helpful thing. But what I come back to about when you're thinking about self-care, from an organisation employer point of view, do I have the policies, procedures and practices in place that ensure people and I ensure that I teach people about them. I have a learning strategy, internal learning strategy around people get working their way through policies and procedures. <clears throat> and I expect to see people doing them. And when people aren't doing them, I need to call them to account. An employee has uh, the responsibility to ensure they understand them and to follow through with them. And if they don't, they should be called uh, to account around these, these things. Um, uh, with the EAP thing, <clears throat> What EAPs don't do is they don't take the pulse. The EAP is the thing you go to and you, you're finally pulling your hair out. But if you're taking the pulse, you might need fewer people to either go, or maybe more people would go a bit earlier, so you get an earlier intervention uh, if you're actually taking the pulse. <clears throat> what do you do with those? What do you do with those? Supervision notes. Oh, supervision notes, thanks. I can't even read people. Yeah. Um, well, what you do with those uh, supervision notes is they're kept. Um, I keep them. I have my own processing notes for supervision, so I have an electronic means of doing that, so I, I only have access to them. Uh, they're not normally performance about performance. However, <clears throat> if things happen in supervision, and normally I look for a theme, not just an event, so somebody might have done a terrible thing with a client, I have done it in my practice, and um, I'm not going to say, well, that's it, performance manage. But if there starts to be a theme to their work, first my role as supervisor to see is can I support this person and shift and change those things? Can I send them to some um, training? Is there personal work they need to do? But there will be a point if I see no shift or change that there becomes a performance issue. And at that point, I need to either say, I think, I need to talk to your manager about this, or if I am your manager, we need to have a session about management and performance. It's during that time, that's when the supervision, when you then go back to the supervision after you've done a performance management, that's when it becomes really tricky. It's really hard. And it may be that you determine that you can't do that management stuff and you have to say to somebody else, look, this is what's happening. Um, I need to decouple myself from being both manager and um, supervisor, given what's happening uh, between us. 
Hi, Gregory. We've just got yes. Sorry. We've got one question in the chat from Sarah McDonald saying, "What are some simple strategies slash tools you would recommend for taking the pulse on a regular basis?" Great. Um, so there are a couple of ways to do this. Uh, one is there are technologies out there. Um, not that I'm flogging, but we have Ripple. Happy to talk to people if they're interested in having a look at that. More than happy to talk about it. You could you could simply create your own paper version of some sort of um, questionnaire to take the pulse and there are simple ones that, that you can find. What you want to do is just, you, this is not a clinical pulse taking and you need to distinguish from what's, what are clinical sort of measuring tools and non-clinical. This is pulse wellbeing that you're doing overall. Clinical is something different. Um, so do not go out and get like, okay, we'll do strengths and difficulties questionnaire every week with staff. You know, it's a clinical tool, screening tool, you don't want that. Um, there are frameworks, simple frameworks you can create uh, to use. Again, happy to talk to people if they'd like to be thinking about that. Um, but, but there are things, e easy things to do, and there are some technologies out there. Um, does anybody have any, um, like, talking questions? So I can see that there are people out there. I can see there are about 70 or 65 people. Does anyone ask a question or make a comment? Even if, if you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand and then I can allow you to talk. We are nearing the end of the webinar though, so... Um, thing. Well, listen, um, well, you've got three minutes to go. Freddie's keeping me, make sure we, that's great. Uh, thank you so much. I hope there's some things. As I said, my, my goal was simply to plant some seeds and give you some ideas of things you, you need to be thinking about both as employer and employee and as supervisor, supervisee and in terms of management. Um, we all have these notes available and this recording will be available on our, our website. It will be password protected for those who have attended the um, seminar, but Freddie will, and operation staff will set that all up. Um, I wish you all the best. Uh, please be safe out there, and um, I hope to see you next time. And the great thing is we did not have, what was it called again, Freddie? A network storm. A network storm. Thank goodness for that. We, we do have a final poll, though. A clap and round of applause to you all, and we'll, um, we'll see you next time. We just have a final oh, poll, sorry. everyone. Oh, my apologies. Yes. <laughs> well done, Freddie. Don't go. Uh, we do have a uh, final poll that Freddie's going to put up. Um, which hopefully is uh, that one there. Poll number five. Just give us an idea of how we went. It's always good to have some um, um, initial feedback, and I'm sure Melbourne City Mission will send out some things too, and we'll be giving people feedback. Yes, I think that there's a, the survey that you should receive um, after leaving this webinar um, from Melbourne City Mission. Great. If you would like to answer that one too, I think they'd really appreciate it. Great, thanks. thanks, everyone. Thanks everyone. So work out the poll, we'll close it some time and we will see you next time. Um, and as I said, please be safe. Again, I'd like to say thanks to Melbourne City Mission and the Family Reconciliation Mediation Programme for making this webinar possible.